And in my short talk today, I just want to give you a few stories to give you a flavor of my research and my arguments. And my basic thesis is this. The way that we've been thinking about technology for the last couple of decades is all wrong. And let me tell you why. First, I want to start with some questions. You don't have to answer these out loud, but maybe just um, answer them to yourselves. Have you ever done one of the following things? Have you jumped onto a train or a bus or a tram without paying the fare and jumped off again? Have you ever downloaded or streamed a film or a piece of music online without paying for it? Have you paid somebody cash in hand knowing that tax wouldn't be paid on that money? I can see some people voluntarily nodding here. You don't need to, you don't need to admit to it. And finally, worst of all, have you ever gone to a buffet at a restaurant or a hotel and taken far more than your fair share, loading your pockets with bread rolls that you can eat later on in the day? Three quarters of British people, and I'm from Britain, uh, admit to having done one of these things. And my respectful submission is that that's not because British people are scoundrels. It's because there is this area of freedom, this little hinterland of naughtiness at the edges of the law, which allows us to do things that are wrong from time to time. But in a world where your smart wallet automatically deducts the fare when you get on and off the train, you can't dodge the fare. You can't pay somebody cash in hand in a cashless economy. You can't take more than your fair share at the buffet if your helping is regulated by face recognition technology. And the reason I use that example is that if you go to the Temple of Heaven Park in Beijing today and decide to use the public facilities there, use the bathroom, you will find that your helping of toilet roll is already regulated by face recognition technology. And the lesson here is that it would be naive of us to suppose that those who make rules in society, be they big companies or governments, will not use all of the technologies that are at their disposal in order to enforce those rules in the future. And so the question becomes not, is this right or wrong, but is this even possible? That's the first story I want to tell. The second concerns Amazon, the internet giant, and a recruitment algorithm that they used for five years earlier in the last decade. And it was a machine learning algorithm, and to simplify it, it basically worked like this. Amazon gave the statistics, uh, Amazon gave the curriculum vitae, the CVs, the resumes, of its most successful employees from the last 10 years to this machine learning system and asked that system to detect in those CVs the patterns that the human eye couldn't see to see what were the regularities among those resumes that would indicate that someone would be a successful employee at Amazon. And then it asked that system to filter out algorithmically job applicants uh, in the first round of applications according to the um, characteristics that that machine had discovered. Now, for reasons which were not at all good reasons, Amazon had been dominated by male employees for the last 10 years. And so perhaps unsurprisingly, what this machine learning system learned was that the key the most likely indicator of success as an employee at Amazon was being a man. And so that meant if you submitted your resume to Amazon for your dream job there, but it happened to contain the name of an all-girls school or an all-women's university, or said women's soccer team rather than just soccer team, your CV would go to the bottom of the pile. And that system was used for five years by Amazon until this was discovered and was put to one side. That's story number two. Third and final story. Last year in the United Kingdom, a chatbot was developed, which was said to be able to answer medical diagnostic questions um, to become a member of the Royal College of General Practitioners with a higher degree of accuracy than the average human doctor. So this is a system which you are posing medical questions to in natural language, like I'm speaking just now, and it would be able to answer those questions in natural language better on average than the people who are actually treating our sick. And I want to imagine for a second that that system had become not just proficient in conversing about medicine, but in conversing about politics. 
and that it wasn't deployed in the privacy of the laboratory, but in the public sphere to argue on behalf of one group or another to advocate for or against the political issues of the day. And imagine further that instead of being a disembodied uh, bot, which was just lines of text on a screen, that rather it had a face and a name and a voice that was in each individual case tailored to what the audience in question, each individual person, found particularly attractive. And it would be able to know what they found attractive based on data that had been gathered about such a person. It's not science fiction. We're not a million miles away from developing these kinds of systems. And so stepping back, what do these three stories that I've told you have in common? I say they have in common this. The first is a story about power and freedom. The people who write the code in society and design the technological products with which we interact increasingly determine what we can and cannot do. So when you take your first drive in a self-driving car and you want to do what you might do if you are operating the vehicle, perhaps it's an emergency and you want to go over the speed limit or you want to park illegally just for a moment, that car may well refuse to do so because of the way that it has been programmed. And increasingly, those who write the codes, be they on digital platforms, be they in the Internet of Things, in the real world, will increasingly determine what we can and can't do. Those are fundamental questions, I say, of liberty. The story about Amazon goes to a different political principle, principles of justice. Who gets jobs in society, who gets employment and on what terms, is not a technical question, it is not a commercial question, it is a political question because a job is one of the most valuable things that you can have. The same goes for insurance or credit for businesses or mortgages for individuals. And what all of these have in common is that increasingly our access to them is mediated by and determined by digital systems. Algorithms which process data that they have about us, make predictions about our future conduct, and decide whether we are entitled to such things, and if so, on what terms. And I'll say it again. Those who write those algorithms are no longer just software engineers. They're social engineers as well. And finally, the chatbot example goes to the heart of what we, uh, at least in um, traditional Western thought, have thought of being a key part of democracy, the deliberative process. In the past, there weren't many things you could rely on when it came to deliberation, but one of them was the idea that the other people you were arguing with would always be human beings. In the future, that may not be the case. Early political chatbots are very crude, drowning out other forms of discourse with tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of repeated hashtags and messages like those that erupted before the Brexit referendum, before the presidential election in the United States, after the death of Jamal Khashoggi, the Turkish journalist, in defense of Saudi Arabia. But in the future, they won't be so subtle. Uh, they won't be so um, unsubtle. They'll be much more subtle, and in many cases, as good as or better or faster than the rest of us when it comes to deliberating. And so, why did I say at the beginning that I think we've been thinking about technology wrong? The answer is this, because my research tells me that in the future, the digital is political. We have tended to look at new technological developments through the eyes of consumers. Where can I get one? How much does it cost? Or as capitalists, how can I exploit this technology? How can I build a business around it? But not as citizens. What does this mean for the public good? How will this change the way that we live together? And once you recognize that digital technologies and those who own, control, and design them are going to be playing a fundamental role in areas which we had previously considered reserved to politics, power, freedom, democracy, justice, you begin to look at technology a different way. You begin to think that actually such systems should possibly be designed and engineered, not just for the private benefit of those who manufacture them, but, the, for, the, but for the public benefit of the community as a whole. And how does this happen? The most common question I'm asked when I give talks is that people say to me, well, what can I do? What can I do in the face of these technological changes? And I give an answer which is often very unpopular, 
which is I say that you as an individual can do very little. It doesn't matter if you leave Facebook, because Facebook has more members than Christianity. It doesn't, doesn't matter if you stop using Google, because there are 60,000 other people using Google every second. Individuals cannot deal with problems that are fundamentally political ones. Political problems, I argue, require a collective response. They require the community to come together. In the same way that the individual worker in the past said, what can I do about my exploitative employee, employer? The answer is nothing. But together in a union, you can do a lot. The peasant of the past said, what can I do about this oppressive king or dictator? And the answer is, on your own, you can do nothing. But together in a mass movement, maybe you can achieve something. And this makes it all sound more radical than it is. But, and I'm frankly, I, you know, I'm a lawyer. I, I, incidentally, I should clarify that being a barrister, it sounds very similar to being a barista who makes coffee, but we are, which I, I can't do. But we're actually the ones who stand in court with the wigs and, and um, look much less dignified than those who make coffee. Um, but as a lawyer, I'm inclined towards in, uh, incremental change. Um, slow, steady developments of the law. But really what I'm calling for just now, and it's an ugly word, is regulation. That is what the community does when it comes together and sets social norms in the forms of laws, of standards, of regulatory bodies. And we see it all around us, and it's so funny that we haven't yet applied it to tech. We wouldn't just let, for instance, doctors perform operations on us or other, other um, acts of social significance prescribing medicine without them being in some way regulated and qualified to do it. And yet we seem entirely happy to be developing systems of extraordinary power which determine the quality of our freedom, the extent of our justice, and the survival of our democracy, and we're prepared to leave those to the free market. My argument is that that thinking is outdated. Ten years ago, it could be forgiven, but it can't anymore. And the great question, I say, in politics of the last century the last century, the great question was this. What should be done by the state and what should be left to the market and civil society? For you and me, I say the question is different now. To what extent should our lives be governed by powerful digital systems and on what terms? Because these systems aren't going away. They're becoming increasingly capable, doing tasks which we previously never thought they'd be able to do. They become increasingly integrated, scattered into the world around us in the form of our objects and architecture, our appliances, smart private spaces and smart public spaces. Frankly, in things we never previously thought of as technology. And we generate more data now as a species every couple of hours than we did from the dawn of time until 2003. This isn't a faster horses situation. This is much more radical than that, and we're just at the beginning of it. But it is our generation that will have to deal with it. And so when I argue in my book, Future Politics, that the digital is political, that is my call to action. That we should think as carefully about the social and political consequences of what we're doing as we do about the commercial and technical implications. Thank you very much.